Hey guys, F Train here. How's it going? <clears throat> Hope you're having a uh, good week and enjoying your spring break. LOL. Um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to. Um, so today we're going to be talking about supernovas. Um, now, if we recall last lesson, we talked about type 1A supernova. Um, so today we're going to talk about another type of su supernova known as a type 2. All right. And so a type 2 supernova um, is, you know, different uh, in a lot of different ways. So we'll talk about that. All right. So for, for example, uh, so for the do now today, why do type 1A supernova make good standard candles to measure distance? And um, if you recall, we mentioned that um, every type 1A supernova happens <clears throat> at a certain point, 1.4, uh, when the um, when a um, white dwarf is 1.4 solar masses. So that's a very very specific mass. Which um, if that all that mass converts into energy, that will be a very specific amount of energy. So that produces a absolute uh, magnitude of about minus 19 or so. So, um, and if you recall, there's also like that sort of that curve as it decays, um, which also um, provides a, you know, very um, specific <coughs> uh, pattern that you can use. All right, so um, in the year 1054, Chinese astronomers saw a guest star in the constellation Taurus. It was so bright, it was actually visible in the daytime. Um, after a month, it faded and it took almost two years to vanish completely. Um, today we see that star, uh, I'm sorry, today uh, in that place, we actually see what we call the Crab Nebula. So what question does this raise? And um, so our aim today is how are other types of supernovae produced? Um, so question, will our sun become a supernova someday? You might be wondering because um, that would be a big deal. Well, it turns out that no, our sun is not big enough to become a supernova. Um, and in terms of type two supernovae, uh, they start out as massive stars greater than about eight times the mass of the sun. Now, what is the primary fuel of most stars, all right? So we've talked about this. Um, we've said that hydrogen fusion um, begins in the core and produces helium. So, um, you know, a, a main sequence star is mostly hydrogen being fused into helium. And that happens at a temperature at least in our sun, about 13 or so million kelvins, all right? And so, again, if you have a, a star on the main sequence, it's burning um, hydrogen. Now, um, as the hydrogen fuses into helium, now you have, at the very center, you have a helium core developing, okay? And, um, you know, because the, uh, the hydrogen in the center will tend to um, fuse at the fastest rate. So that'll fuse, uh, form helium. And then, as we mentioned, you'll have these shells of hydrogen outside it that are burning, okay? Uh, now, what should happen as the hydrogen is used up and the rate of fusion decreases? Well, <clears throat> as this um, helium, you know, now the helium, it's not hot enough for the helium to fuse. And so what's gonna happen is you have this sort of inert helium. It's the helium's not fusing, so that helium's gonna kind of cool down and it's gonna contract. Um, and eventually as it contracts, it'll get hotter, okay? And eventually if it reaches the helium fusion point, which is like 100 million Kelvin, then the helium will uh, fuse producing carbon. So now you're going to have this um, you're going to have this sort of uh, carbon core now, and then just outside of the carbon you'll have 
helium and then outside of the helium you'll have carbon so you're going to have this sort of expanding um bunch of layers all right and so the um you know and, and sort of the ash of the helium fusion is carbon just like the ash of hydrogen fusion is helium the ash of helium fusion is carbon all right and then <clears throat> and what can happen then is if you have a large enough star so for example in this case they're showing a 25 solar mass star uh, eventually you'll end up with um, different um, different layers you'll first have uh, helium hydrogen fusing into helium and for this star right here uh, 25 solar mass that'll take about um, you know seven million years to fuse the hydrogen to the helium then the helium to carbon that'll take maybe only like 700,000 years and then for all the carbon to fuse into oxygen it'll take like 600 years and then uh, and then after that oxygen will fuse into silicon and you can see as you know as it happens the closest uh, you know the further you go to the center of the star the heavier elements are being formed silicon will eventually f fuse into um, iron in one day okay and so you're going to end up having iron and then you're having the silicone fusing into iron you'll have oxygen fusing into silicone carbon fusing into oxygen helium fusing into carbon and hydrogen fusing into helium so you have these different layers of of the star here um, so the process repeats as heavier elements fuse eventually the iron uh, the core becomes iron and you'll notice the duration is now why does the rate accelerate as heavier elements are um, are produced and you might want to you know think about that for a minute or two and um, and so the reason for that is that as heavier elements are produced there are fewer nuclei to fuse so if you, you think about it, if you have you know a certain amount of matter if it's all hydrogen, you got a lot of hydrogen nuclei. But if it's all iron, now you've got like, you know, a lot fewer nuclei to fuse and therefore you're gonna have less energy being released. And so that's gonna tend to allow it to then, um, you know, it's gonna allow it to contract more, get hotter and go through the energy a lot, uh, the fuel a lot faster, okay? Um, if you've ever, maybe from chemistry, remember a diagram like this, the average binding energy per nucleon uh, for different elements. And, um, and the question is, why is iron the end of the line for these processes? Well, if you look, um, elements that are less massive than iron uh, nuclei, uh, they will fuse together. And when they fuse together, they will release energy. Elements heavier than iron, they will break apart and when they break apart they will release energy however iron is the most stable element so um you know it's kind of right in the middle so you don't get any energy out when you fuse it and you don't get any energy out if you break it apart okay um in order for it to actually um fuse into heavier elements, it would actually require that you um, put energy into it, okay? It's, it would be an endothermic, does not release energy. So what happens to the core if no energy is being released? Well, we know from, from the past that if you know, energy is being released, you still have all this outward pressure pushing in, it's gonna cause that core to contract. And what you're gonna end up with is what we call the great collapse. So if the mass of the iron core is greater than about 1.4 solar masses, the iron core will collapse. Now this collapse takes less than a second. And um, as it's collapsing, the temperatures, because it's happening so quick, it's happening at you know, a, a significant fraction of the speed of light, um, it will produce temperatures in excess of 10 billion Kelvin. And, um, and as that happens, you're gonna get very, very high energy gamma rays being, uh, being released. Um, these gamma rays then will be smashing into the atoms that are next to them and, and actually disintegrate those atoms, um, those nuclei into their 
uh, back into protons and neutrons. Um, now, what happens when protons and neutrons are forced together? Well, what happens is that um, if you have a proton and an electron forced together, they will form a neutron plus a neutrino. Now, that neutrino then will carry some of the energy away, which will then cool the core. Um, and then, of course, as the core cools, it contracts even further. Now, remember, this is all happening in like a second. So, um, you know, it's not like it's happening in stages. Um, but the core will contract even further. Um, now, as the core contracts, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much, uh, um, you know, it, it's gone past the point where um, even the, the electron degeneracy pressure is holding it. It's actually causing those electrons to fuse into the um, protons and things. Um, however, once um, the core reaches the density of a nucleus, um, the strong force, instead of being an attractive force, actually becomes a repulsive force. And you end up with something called the neutron degeneracy pressure. So now you have this big ball of neutrons. A lot of the, the protons have all become neutrons now. So you have a big ball of neutrons. And um, as that you know, ball of neutrons is um, encountered, that can't fuse anymore. And so you're going to get this big bounce. Um, it's called the great bounce. And, um, and you're going to get an outward shock wave. And this shock wave is, is a wave of energy that has so much energy that it will actually um, be able to fuse new uh, heavier elements. And now we're talking, it'll fuse the elements that are heavier than iron. So if you look at your periodic table and look at all these, you know, heavy elements that are heavier than iron, that's the only place in the universe where uh, um, where elements heavier than iron can be produced, okay? So all the gold, all the platinum, you know, all the mercury that we find on Earth was originally produced in a supernova, type two supernova explosion somewhere in the universe. <clears throat> um, and that's also why these elements are, are so rare, uh, because, you know, um, then they, they seed clouds, and those clouds then form new stars like our star, but there's not that much of it. And so, um, you know, there's not a lot of these heavier elements. So when the shock wave reaches the surface, these newly created elements are expelled into the interstellar medium. Uh, I'm going to show you a... Um, Okay, take that back. I'm not going to show you that video. The video was removed from YouTube. Um, so what's left? Well, the answer to that question depends upon the mass of the star. Um, if the mass of the star is anywhere between about 1.4 to 3 solar masses, um, you're going to get what we call a neutron star. Okay, and a neutron star is something that would be like the size of New York City. So imagine a star one and a half times the mass of the sun, but in a radius of about 10 kilometers, okay? It's so dense, so dense that the uh, escape velocity at the surface would be like seven tenths the speed of light, okay? That's how dense that would be. Um, if the mass of the iron core is greater than three solar masses, then um, even, even the neutron degeneracy pressure is not going to be great enough to um, hold the, um, you know, hold the thing from collapsing and, and you get a black hole, which we'll talk about in a future lesson. Um, the ejected material becomes a nebula. And, um, and you can tell the difference between a type 1A and a type 2 uh, supernova because um, the type two supernova will have hydrogen in its spectrum. Okay, remember we said that uh, type two, type one A supernova is the basically the immediate um, uh, um, explosion of of carbon. So no hydrogen. Well, you still have hydrogen in the in the um, 
supernova. So you'll have some hydrogen lines that are avail uh, that are visible in the spectrum. Okay, so anyway, that's uh, that's the lesson on type two supernova. I'm gonna um, link a couple videos uh, since this is probably a pretty interesting subject for a lot of you guys. So I will link a couple of videos that you might want to look at and hopefully enjoy them. I'm not gonna be posting um, too many assignments this week because uh, we're supposed to give you guys a chance to kind of do alternate forms of learning. So um, uh, maybe I'll send you guys some optional um, videos to watch, okay? Anyway, have a great day and talk to you guys soon.